This podcast and content posted by Dr. Judith Joseph is presented solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from this podcast or website is at the user's own risk. It is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, psychotherapist, or other qualified professional diagnoses or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical or mental health condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. 988 Day on September 8th is a national initiative to raise awareness about suicide prevention. Every parent should listen to this important episode of The Vault during National Suicide Prevention Month. Dr. Tia Dole is a licensed psychologist who is a thought leader and advisor to countries worldwide to create suicide prevention programs. Talking about high functioning depression and I was like, oh, they must be talking to Dr. Joseph because that's your thing. Pushing past feeling terrible in order to be productive is probably one of the worst things that we've done to women in our society right now. She is currently the chief 988 suicide and crisis lifeline officer at Vibrant Emotional Health and the former chief of clinical operations at the Trevor Project, the world's largest suicide prevention program for LGBTQ plus youth. It's just an ingrained culture within, I mean, across the world within girls to push, 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 that our feelings don't matter, that it doesn't matter if you're tired, you will be praised, you will be put on a pedestal if you can do it all with grace. And it's exhausting. And while looking cute. Right, <laughs> let's not forget that. <laughs> she discussed what every parent should know about raising boys, girls, and youth to decrease the risk of suicide and how you can identify the warning signs. Dr. Tia, thank you so much for being on The Vault. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. The last time I saw you, we were on a panel mm -hmm. for Columbia, mm -hmm. and it was a Women's Day event, a Women's Month event, and there was something that you said that just like, whoa, as a child psychiatrist, I was like, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. You, um, One of the women in the audience asked about how to bond with her daughter, or it was about child mental health, and you said one of the most protective factors... I think you said two of the most protective factors for young women, young girls, was sitting and having dinner with their family every night and playing sports. Yes. And protective in terms of their mental health, in terms yep. of prevention of suicide. And I was just like, wow, I need to make sure I'm eating dinner with my daughter every night. Yes. Yep. <laughs> and she needs to be in a team sport. So tell, tell me about that because your line of work is so intense, so important, mm -hmm. and you have access to information that really, like many of us only learn about months down the line after they've hit a headline. So mm -hmm. tell me more about those protective factors in youth that all yeah. parents should know about. Well, and, and just as a side note, you know, it, there's protective factors based on identity, right? So mm -hmm. for girls, right, being on a team sport, um, you know, for LGBTQ youth, the b biggest protective factor is having one accepting adult in their life. And so, you know, it's it's actually really a Google away, right? If you think about who is my child um, and if you as a parent are like, what can I do? What are the one or two things that I can do? Um, you can look it up, right? And see um, what you can do, simple things that you can do, because realistically speaking, most of the things that we offer young people and young women is it's actually just time. If you really kind of dig down to the root of what is a protective factor is actually spending time with someone, being accepting of their identity and who they are and their perspective, um, and actually also making time for yourself. Uh, you know, one of the things I noted about what we talked about in the panel was the emphasis that you um, put on understanding that even women who are functioning beautifully um, are still kind of grinding themselves down with, with over-functioning and what that, you you know, I'm always struck by, I actually, I feel like someone was quoting you. I was somewhere recently and they were like talking about high functioning depression. And I was like, oh, they must be talking to Dr. Joseph because that's your thing. Um, and how um, pushing past feeling terrible in order to be productive is probably uh, one of the worst things that we've done to women uh, in our society right now. I kind of changed the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you know what? It was so well said. And, you know, not just women, but girls. Mm -hmm. I'm from a Caribbean household. Mm -hmm. And I, my parents, I think they did a great job raising us. But within the Caribbean West, uh, West Indian community, being the girl in the kitchen, helping out, making the roti, making the curry, 
serving the guests, <laughs> greeting, and my dad's a pastor, greeting the guests oh. when they come into the church and all that. You know, I, I was like, you know, Timothy, my brother didn't have to do any of that, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but there, it's just an ingrained culture within, I mean, across the world within mm-hmm. girls mm-hmm. to push, push, push that our mm-hmm. feelings don't matter. That it doesn't matter if you're tired, mm-hmm. you will be praised. You will be put on a pedestal if you can do it all with grace. And it's exhausting. And while looking cute. Right. <laughs> Let's not forget that. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Mm-hmm. And, and it's something that if, I think because of social media and because we're so connected these days and we're, many of us are aware of these themes that Mm -hmm. we're seeing. It's not just our family. It happens across the world Mm -hmm. that it's an opportunity for us to put an end to this pattern, Mm -hmm. to call it out Mm -hmm. and to change it because Mm -hmm. our girls are suffering. And there was Mm -hmm. a recent CDC data that was, uh, I think it was released like in February of last year where girls really are suffering. They are uh, reporting high rates Mm -hmm. of abuse, Mm -hmm. high rates of suicidality, depression, Mm -hmm. anxiety. And, you know, this is, this is a sign we need to do something about it. What are some of the things that are most effective in supporting girls these days? Mm. So, um, you know, if you, if you kind of think about um, the systems surrounding girls, right? You have, um, you know, the family unit, you have the friends unit, you have school, you have work, right? You can think of it like a, a circle, essentially. And I feel like you've talked about this too before, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think if you think about what can happen in each layer of those units, you start out in the family unit. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the who, who listens to your podcast in particular, but let's say if they're parents. Um, what you can do is actually um, understand what kind of pressures that you're putting on. This is this this is sort of, I would say, anecdotal based on my experience um, as a clinician for 20 years, um, which is that there are a lot of pressures that we as parents place on our children um, that we're unaware of. Um, and so consciously saying, you know, to my to yourself, what are the expectations that I'm setting for my daughter in particular, but also for my son? What are the things that they're supposed to do in the household? How are they supposed to perform in school? How are they? What kind of pressure am I putting on them, or what kind of feedback am I putting on them in terms of um, how they look? One of the things that we don't talk about enough is the pressure that we put on our kids to socialize. So one of the things you think about, a lot of the kids in high school right now are COVID kids. And COVID had a a, a very intense impact on, let's say, people, let's say someone who's a senior graduating from high school now was in eighth grade in COVID, right? And so they spent 18 months, my kids spent 18 months at home not going to school. And I can say my 17-year-old is just now feeling comfortable socially. And so... One of the things is we're like, well, when we were your age, we were always out with our friends. When we were your age, we had these type of diverse friendships. And these this cohort of young people and even thinking about like the eighth graders now um, lost uh, more than 18 months. They lost several years of socialization and during a critical time period. And so when we're saying, well, why aren't you hanging out with your friends? Why aren't you doing this thing? That actually doesn't encourage them to do so. It creates a sense of shame um, and actually makes them pull back. And so thinking about how can I um, create expectations for my child that are are in line with my own values. Because most parents, if they have a sense of what pressure they're exerting, wouldn't do it. Um, And so like, even like you take a piece of paper and say, okay, what are my expectations in terms of these different domains? And how am I communicating these expectations to my child? Are those in line with what I think is a realistic expectation for my values, but also for who this child is? You have two children. Um, my, I parent both of my children very differently because my younger one is fully independent, um, but she is actually, uh, not, she's not going to listen to this, she'd be very rude, right? And so my, <laughs> naturally, she's a naturally rude person. And she's like, what? Um, and so my communication around her is about the way that respectful communication with with your peers, with your elders, constant, right? My older one is the sweetest pie. She's easy, but she can be irresponsible. My communication with her is really about follow through responsibility, not taking off more than you can choose. And so like there is a world where you spend a little time 
instead of, you know, doing something else is spending time thinking about what you are bringing to the table as a parent. I would start there. No, I think that you're, you're right. It's about knowing your child and accepting Mm -hmm. them. We talk about acceptance a lot in terms of, you know, LGBTQ plus, Mm -hmm. but acceptance is Mm -hmm. important across the board. And, um, you know, there are, there are these wonderful books. Uh, one that I could think of siblings without rivalry, where Oh yeah. That's uh, a great book. Mm -hmm. It's a great book because, you know, it really talks about how we unknowingly label our kids Mm -hmm. without giving them a chance. Like, you know, I was the middle child, Mm -hmm. but my sister was the eldest and she was kind of like the third parent. And when Mm -hmm. we, and then my brother was the baby. So it was like, Mm -hmm. if we use these labels and we don't actually think about our child's character and their traits and their individualism, then they unconsciously soak that up and they start fitting into these roles and they may be resentful. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what you were saying about your child having different communication styles, what it, what I thought about when you were saying that was, okay, sometimes as parents, we have to think about what it is that we're projecting onto our children, Mm -hmm. right? Because Mm -hmm. maybe we're so anxious about them missing out on that year of life that Mm -hmm. we unknowingly project onto them our anxiety and we're like, you need to do this and you need to make this friend. Why aren't you talking to that friend? And it's unhealthy for them Mm -hmm. because we're unhealthy. We're not dealing with our anxiety the right way, you Mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So projection is so important. Uh, When it comes to our, uh, our, the, our boys, uh, we're seeing Mm -hmm. that there's a lot of targeting in terms of social media for, Mm -hmm. for, young boys. And this is a, a group that we didn't traditionally, you know, we weren't terribly concerned about them before. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should have been, but lately they've been targets of, um, you know, sexual crimes. And mm-hmm. it is something that many parents feel like the rug was pulled out from under them. No one ever talked to them about this. And um, what advice would you give to your children, to, you know, parents around their children, especially the the boys, Mm -hmm. um, their behaviors online with regards to this. Right. Well, what I'll say is boys are catching up to girls in all things, Um, Mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and not for nothing, you know, not that you asked about it, but black boys between the ages of six and 10 are the most likely to die by by suicide out of every ethnic group. So there, there is uh, something is happening to our boys. Um, I think, you know, one of the things for social media in particular is, you know, the age range is it, it just, they're supposed to start at 13, which is really hard as a parent because so many, so much socialization happens um, before that on social media, like, oh, we're going to connect here. We're going to have this funny thing. I, you know, my first thing is wait as long as you possibly can before you allow your child to download TikTok or um, Instagram. So starting there, right? Not starting at eight or nine. I, I, I've walked down the street and I've seen kids on, you know, YouTube in their strollers. Um, and I said, so, oh, I'm always, I always want to say, oh, <laughs> please, please pull it back, pull it back. And it's hard. Once you give it, it's hard to pull it back. The second thing is the way that we prep g- girls around risks and danger is not the way that we prep boys. So girls, you know, you're always teaching them to take a defensive stance, pay attention to your surroundings. If you feel uncomfortable, call us or, you know, boys don't receive, right? That boys receive information like, you know, potentially like a more traditional household, be a man, stand up for for yourself, but not that you could be the victim of sex trafficking or that you may receive, um, you know, some grooming um, DMs on social media. Um, And in part, it it is a stigma around the fact that sexual abuse does happen to boys. um, And that actually is a really devastating lifelong effect on boys potentially. And so it is actually our fears as an adult and our, our biases that these things don't happen to boys and we don't want them to know. So, you know, realistically speaking, the same conversation that you have with your girl, you have with your boy, which is when you go over to your best friend's house and the dad makes you feel uncomfortable, um, just text me. I'll come get you immediately. You don't need to provide a reason for why you feel uncomfortable. Pay attention. And I do think... Um, with girls, you kind of tend to lean in on pay attention to your instincts if your body is telling you something. But we don't say that to boys. Um, boys, I feel, are uh, 
disconnected from their bodies earlier than girls and from knowing their emotions and their, um, you know, experiences so much earlier than girls. And that often happens to girls later in life. So um, actually, even thinking about um, toughen up, you're a boy, you can take this. All those things disconnect boys from from themselves um, as as feeling people. And so, you know, are you are you saying those types of things to boys? Because what you're doing is invalidating their experiences, feeling people, um, and then it actually puts them at risk for being preyed on by, um, you know, terrible adults. And, and we tell boys to hit back, to don't let mm-hmm. anyone, if somebody hits you, hit them back, but mm-hmm. children are vulnerable. And, it, yeah. and that is not how predators approach children. They don't approach them like aggressively. They approach right. them with sweets. Okay. They approach them with compliments. They approach them in, in yeah. places where they shouldn't be like, yeah. p- Children should feel safe in these spaces, but unfortunately, that's where predators. Well, and one thing that people never talk about is that oftentimes boys who have been molested, their bodies have a physical reaction to what is happening. And that creates confusion, right? They're pre-adolescent. They might be starting to head towards adolescence, and you know, right? I am feeling a physical reaction in my body. Does that mean that I like it, that I uh, tried to get this? You know, in and, and and it just produces such a deep shame um, that they often then don't tell. And so, understanding that your body may have a reaction that seems like it feels good, but your mind and heart feel bad, and like that disconnect between your mind, heart, and body. Not to it's not psycho- psychological terms, but like a, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. layman's term is like I actually think is also part of the reason why you might see promiscuity in uh, adult men, um, which is like they have disconnected their physical body from their emotional body. Um, And, you know, it's hard to come back from that. Yes, it's very difficult. And when you talk to children, because children inherently believe that it's somehow their fault, they have Mm -hmm. that magical thinking that Mm -hmm. somehow if they had done something differently, this would have, this wouldn't have happened or maybe you know this happened because they're a bad person mm-hmm. so when you talk to children both girls and boys or whoever they identify it's important to tell them it is not their fault right. they did nothing to bring this on even if their body felt good mm-hmm. it doesn't mean anything right mm-hmm. um, and unfortunately i think you're right i think a lot of adult men are disconnected and that's why mm-hmm. you know they have a hard time attaching in a healthy mm-hmm. way to their partners mm-hmm. or to mm-hmm. multiple partners um, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to touch on was um, using social media to self-diagnose because uh, this, well. <laughs> <laughs> this, this month I, um, I taught a, a course at, for young doctors at NYU and I teach it every year to really empower them to be able to educate the masses with Mm -hmm. evidence-based information. Mm -hmm. Many of them are very shy about it. They're like, oh, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm afraid of how I'm going to be seen. But I always give this pep talk, and I've been teaching this course for 10 years. I say, if you don't do it, someone else will. And the someone else may not have, you know, your evidence-based training. They may have a history of depression. They may have a history of an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. But just because you have something doesn't mean you're an expert in it. Whereas as clinicians, we see hundreds of, of people. We have treated people who have had successes in their treatment, people who have had failures in their treatment or perceived failures. But, you know, we just have this wealth of information. And if we're not the ones out there doing it, mm-hmm. then, you know, what's going to happen to you know mental health? But one of the things that came up uh, was the self-diagnosis. They're seeing a lot of young people coming in and saying that they have conditions that they don't necessarily have. And the biggest one lately has been um, autistic uh, behaviors. Many people are self-diagnosing as being autistic and um, these clinicians are having to explain the differences between what is autistic, what is not, what is neurodivergence, you know, and so forth. So what do you make of that pattern that we're seeing right now? Yeah, that's a great question. You mean in terms of like, what do I make of like why so many people are self-diagnosing and or self-diagnosing in this way? So there's a few things. Come, I think that now that folks are confused about what they're feeling in themselves. 
Um, I think, you know, so I'll speak generally, which is that, you know, when I, I grew up in the 80s, right? When I grew up in the 80s, you know, oftentimes you have multi-generational living. Um, people have a real sense of connectedness to their family. And now, you know, fast forward 40 years, 50 years, um, I think that that people are living in isolation far more than they have been before, right? The Surgeon General published that um, report last year, which I thought was probably the best thing to come out of the federal government in years uh, around the epidemic of loneliness. So I'll, I'll root, root this that I think that culturally or societally, there is something happening where people feel very alone in their experience and disconnected from the people that they should feel connected with. I don't feel this connection with my sibling or my parent or from my friends. I don't feel like the way that I think I should feel or the way that I see it playing out in movies. Um, and so there's that. I think number two, um, we've gotten much better about diagnosing, let's say, um, autism than we did 30, 40 years ago, right? 30, 40 years ago it would just be a person who's quirky or you use different descriptive words to describe um, people. And to a certain extent, it's a bit of a loss because diagnosing someone can be incredibly helpful for someone to understand, okay, this is what happens. But I do think that it creates um, like a, you know, that diagnosis also then can create a shield, right? Or create a lack of motivation to change things that they might have the ability to change. And I think that it it categorizes people, it slices people into smaller types of identities that is not also particularly helpful. So, you know, as people go into social media, because that's what people use nowadays, I, I always say, please go to CDC dot gov or please go to even Mayo Clinic or even Cleveland Clinic, right? They have really great um, ways where at least my clients in particular have found it helpful is actually using social media to find other people who have the same experience. And what I see is the best benefit of it um, is to have words to describe their experience that they didn't have before. I think that's the probably the biggest usefulness because most people don't say, Oh, I've been diagnosed with autism. Let me look at resources to address these things. They're like, oh, this is now I have a new identity. This is who I am. It, it can't change. Um, absolutely not, right? If you have a uh, social anxiety, you uh, you know you're you are someone who has who is living with autism. There are things that you can do um, and ways that you can communicate with people. Hey, this is this is how I work best, right? Um, and that that's the that's what could happen but i think oftentimes it's like no this is i am this person um so and not for nothing last thing is that i think that people are looking for ways to belong to groups mm -hmm. and so being diagnosed as a thing um, means that you're actually part of a group of people who are also diagnosed with as, with the same thing so i have a a peer group now that i didn't before i think it definitely spot on with the last one because mm -hmm. Even online, if you look at the comment section, sometimes on the accounts, it looks like a group therapy session. People are giving <laughs> each other advice. <laughs> They're sharing their experience back and forth and the comments can go on for days. So sure. that, that is replacing the, mm -hmm. the sense of community that we once had that was traditionally mm -hmm. in person. Yeah. I yep. always ask my experts about a time in their lives when on the outside, they were just doing so many wonderful things, collecting accolades and Everyone thought, wow, they have it figured out. They have it all together. But they knew that inside they were having challenges. Mm -hmm. And how mm -hmm. did they get through that? And mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you that question. I will. I, will, I can tell you right now, my best friend, <laughs> her name is Michelle. Um, and no, I will say, you know, I can think about the toughest periods in my life. And how I've gotten through it is not by myself. Um, it's actually by telling other people that I'm struggling and saying, I actually need this. I need some help here. Um, and like, can you, can you help? Uh, and I think it's in particular, you know, I know you're a parent as well. When you are struggling and you are a parent, whew, it's very hard. 
Um, and you're like, you know, I had both of my children in graduate school, which looking back was kind of wild. Um, and, um, you know, uh, being early career person trying to, you know, get my hustle on right with two little kids by myself, it was intense. And, um, I, in looking back, I wish I had asked for more help, um, that I had said, Hey folks, you know, I need you to take these kids overnight, <laughs> because I just need to sit with my, you know, glass of rosé. Um, but so, yeah, no, it really is, is just um, that and um, uh, doing something poorly and being okay with it. Um, you know, the house doesn't have to look good. Although I have to say the house looking a mess actually increases um, my anxiety. So, you know, whatever it is, the thing that I can let go of, just let it go. It's okay. Yeah, I think you're right because women, in particular mothers, we feel so guilty when we let mm -hmm. anyone down, but we don't realize that we're letting ourselves down right. all the time. Mm -hmm. And and in our life, we have to take care of ourselves. We have to prioritize ourselves or else, mm -hmm. you know, the people that depend on us, they suffer too. So then we're all suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the guilt, the guilt needs to be challenged all the time. Yeah. We have to really challenge it. We have to support each other mm -hmm. and leaning on friends, talking yeah. with friends. That well, really but so coming back to so guilt, hard. right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I lean in on this really hard with my clients, which is like, you know, the difference between guilt and shame, shame, uh, feeling bad about who you are, guilt, feeling bad about something that you've done. Um, I'm, I think that guilt is a use, useless emotion and I actually generally refuse to experience it. Um, and the, <laughs> the reason for that is generally speaking, I can say with all honesty, I do my best in every domain of my life. If I don't do something well, it is not through a lack of effort, it is lack of capacity. And so if I know that to be true and something messes up, um, I, I will not feel guilty about it because I have I have literally done my best there. This is the outcome that I received. And, um, you know, guilt is an emotion that people usually train to experience as children. Um, and it's a method of control. Um, and I'm not interested in that. So, uh, you know, as I tell my, some of my clients, I'll be like, you know, our goal is for you to give fewer shits about this thing. Uh, <laughs> and, and if I can help you, which is like, who cares? Like, what does that impact? Are you living your life for other people? Um, you know, you can do this thing and it, and it nearly crushes you volunteering at church, but it really is too much. And, you know, people are going to think the thing. Yeah, they're going to think a thing. How many? Two. So those two people that you don't even like are going to think the thing. How do, are you going to lose 20 hours of your life over the next two weeks for those two people who are going to think the thing and actually probably think the thing regardless because they didn't like the way they did the thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of guilt. I'm going to start using that. I'm going to start like discarding that emotion. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you can let go of it. Right. And I know that you said you come from a West Indian background. Ooh. Bread and butter. And religion. And you religious. Are, Come yes, on now. Yes, and religion. I you are a served. Lot of guilt. <laughs> yes. You are served. I refuse because it is not, it does not motivate me. It doesn't help me get the thing done. It doesn't actually do anything, but actually, it actually demotivates me because then if you feel guilt, then you feel shame. I did a, I did a thing poorly. And then now I'm a bad person because I did a thing poorly. No, no, thanks. Right. And there's a difference between being sorry about something mm -hmm. and then being guilty about something. Like you said, y mm -hmm. you don't have to feel guilty about it. Totally different thing. Mm -hmm. Where can we find you, follow you and support your organization? I don't use social media. Uh, so <laughs> I think I have an Instagram account that's sort of defunct. Um, so, uh, you know, we are, you know, vibrant.org. I run the 988 Lifeline, of course. Um, but, you know, I guess I'm on LinkedIn. That's about it. But, uh, you know, for my own mental health, that's why I'm not on it. Um, but, you know, you can always email me. And we could definitely follow your organization yeah. and support it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being on The Vault today. And I Thank hope to you see you soon. Me. Yeah. <laughs>